Hi, I'm David Redmond from AncientMiddleEast.com, and this is the short version of the Battle of Thapsus on the map. There's also a 40-minute discussion video of academically why the battle is up here in northeast Tunisia, not down there on the rump of Tunisia, where everyone else wrongly puts it, basically because of an error of Strabo causing the modern professional Barrington Atlas to place it in the wrong place. So feel free to watch that. I also have a much longer video where we just read Caesar's account as we watch what happens on the map. So thanks a lot for your consideration and let's get to the battle. 46 years before the word became incarnate in Galilee. Here in Thapsus, here where Rome overlapped with the wilds of Africa, a hydra, a water beast, emerged from the sea of Gentiles and the course of human fallen secular history ended. All subsequent history would be mere regressions and rehash, but this was the eschatological culmination of all secular politics. For here at Thapsus, the Bible's prophecy would achieve full fruition. For here, for the first time, would appear, uncontested, the first head of the final beast of Daniel. A beast, Daniel said, which was, quote, not like other beasts, for they had their crowns upon their heads. But this beast had his crowns instead upon the horns themselves, the very symbols of military power. And such an uncrowned head indeed was Caesar, a new kind of ruler, an emperor, one expressly without a crown, thus outwardly mild, yet whose thoughts and utterances would dictate the constitutions of the whole world. It was prophesied that this beast, this giant, would be shattered only by a hurled stone, cut by no human hand from a mountain. Nevertheless, trusting in their own strength, many human hands would try to win that glory for themselves from the nobles at Pharsalus, and again here at Thapsus, against Caesar, the first head, until the Jewish zealots against Vespasian, the seventh. All attempts would catastrophically fail. For the prophecy said that the beast would be, quote, terrible and dreadful and exceedingly strong, with great iron teeth, which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. Here at Thapsus, we can still completely verify this 2,000 years later today by looking down from the air and seeing the archaeological evidence strewn for miles in all directions. For the grapes were now ripe, and mankind's course of history was ending. After Caesar destroyed the army of Pompey at the 48 BC Battle of Pharsalus in east central Greece and chased him to Egypt, the Republicans were left with only the realms of northern Africa, particularly the kingdom of King Juba I of Numidia. Caesar's opponents were Metellus Scipio, Cato the Younger, King Juba, and his former lieutenant, Titus Labienus. Not willing to wait for his troops to concentrate at Lilibaeum, Caesar offloaded his first two legions to the local island of Aponiana, and with them rushed precipitously across the Straits of Sicily to Adramedum, a Republican stronghold and lookout point where he set up camp despite not having enough troops to lay siege. As his transport ships were scattered all over, not even knowing where he had landed, he decided to head for the nearby port of Rispina as his main disembarkation point. But as he was departing his camp, Juba's cavalry happened to arrive at that moment and began harassing his rear. Surprisingly, <laughs> 30 Gallic horse of Caesar repulsed Juba's 2,000 moors and drove them back into Outer Medum, enabling Caesar to continue his march to Rispina, where he set up camp. Caesar briefly headed down to Leptis Minor, where he set up camp and received the town's submission, and where some of his fleet arrived, thus increasing his scanty cavalry. However, as his water carriers were carrying water to and fro from the ships, some Moorish horse were able to sneak up and launch a surprise raid upon them, scattering them. Indeed, Caesar's greatest need now was supplies, and so he sent out orders for them to all his lieutenants in the adjoining provinces, and also sent a raid to the Rep Republican island of Circina, 
with its granaries. Then himself returned to Ruspina to send out foraging parties. After that, intending to secretly embark to find the whereabouts of the rest of his fleet, he found that they suddenly arrived at Ruspina at that very moment. Disembarking them, he, he led them along with all of his troops on another foraging expedition through the countryside. Three miles from Ruspina, he ran into the enemy, who from a distance appeared so tightly packed that he didn't realize that they were nearly all cavalry, also somewhat interspersed with light infantry runners and archers. Caesar's legions were easily enveloped, and he had to fight in a circle. After a while, Caesar broke them by thrusting out his wings, thus breaking their encirclement, and then attacking one direction, then the other. As he was heading back to camp, the enemy received reinforcements and attacked again. Despite the fact that Caesar's army wasn't fit for a chase, he ordered them anyways to suddenly attack and not stop until they had driven the enemy past the furthest visible hill, which ended their attempts that day. A few days later, the two armies met in a clash of supposedly 50,000 republicans against Caesar's several legions, which may have been a very bloody setback to Caesar, because he both omits to describe any details, and afterwards immediately sets to heavily fortifying his camp at Ruspina, even enlisting his ships' crews, for, well, the excuse he gives is that supposedly both Scipio's and Juba's armies were about to arrive, Scipio with eight more legions and Juba with innumerable cavalry. Scipio indeed arrived and set up camp, but Juba, after almost arriving, headed back home when his capital city, Sirta, was sacked and slaughtered by two of Caesar's allies. Meanwhile, Labienus led an unsuccessful cavalry raid attempting to surprise the town of Leptis. At the same time, Scipio did daily offers of battle in front of Caesar's camp, which of course Caesar didn't accept since none of his veteran legions were yet present. Meanwhile, Caesar received a request for a garrison from the town of Asilla, and sending it, it got caught in a race with a similar one sent by the Republicans. Caesar's arrived first, so the other laid siege. Meanwhile, Caesar received two more legions from Sicily, as well as the corn from his raid on the island of Circina. Tellingly, two Getulian spies sent to spy on Caesar voluntarily defected to him and arranged for numerous soldiers from the Republicans' 4th and 6th legions to defect to him. Thoroughly strengthened now, and expecting even more troops from Sicily, Caesar began his maneuvers. Slipping out of his camp, he marched up a row of hills until he was blocked by a guard station of Scipio's Numidians. And Caesar fortified the whole ridge up to that point with redoubts and entrenchments. Seeing this, Scipio and Labienus drew out their whole army and approached within 1,500 paces of Caesar's laboring legions. At this point, Caesar launched a diversion and had his Spanish cavalry and their light infantry attack the blocking guard station, which they carried, driving the Numidian garrison out into the field. To support his fleeing soldiers, Scipio detached his nearly whole right wing of cavalry. In response, Caesar sent his own cavalry which was hidden from view, first by the valley, and then by a villa with four turrets, until they suddenly attacked Scipio's unit, utterly surprising and shattering them, half of whom fled. The other half, Gauls and Germans, were surrounded and annihilated, with Labienus himself almost being captured. Caesar extended his fortifications to the Numidian guard station, and it is probable at this time that he built this camp here. When Scipio's army, shocked by this, didn't come out the next day, Caesar headed for his supply lines Hinge and Lynchpin at Uzita. Unwilling to lose this, Scipio was forced to come out and defend the city, which Caesar, unwilling to attack, therefore temporarily retreated from, but which would consequently become the main objective of Caesar's maneuvers. This isn't written in the account, but we can see from the location that Caesar is attempting to tactically encircle Scipio, either by cutting to the northeastern shore, or perhaps even by crossing the entire peninsula with walls. At this point, Scipio started calling in his resources. 
So the siege of Asilla was abandoned, the garrison recalled, and even more importantly, Juba's massive cavalry army came back, settling into its own camp next to Scipio's. Scipio now felt strong enough to seize first one and then a second hill closer to Caesar's defense lines. Caesar switched theater, attempting to outflank sideways. Scipio, anticipating this, hit a hammer and anvil ambush in an olive grove and hill filled with caves that he knew Caesar would have to pass through. But as Caesar's cavalry approached the hill, some of Scipio's troops panicked and gave themselves away prematurely, retreating up the hill. Caesar's cavalry charged and killed these, capturing the rest, then turned to seize the hilltop. Meanwhile, Scipio's cavalry unluckily blundered forward just in time to be cut off from behind by Caesar's cavalry coming over the top, scattering them in panic. Caesar fortified this new hill and added a camp, which also expedited desertions from Scipio to his side. He now began retargeting Uzida, this time with, quote, lines of communication, close quotes, stretched across the hillside. His goal being doubly to first sink wells there, and also to bombard it with artillery, which he did for multiple days. Scipio now rounded the corner and seized the next hill to maintain his connection with the mountain which resulted in a giant standoff, Caesar not wanting to attack, both because forward progress would expose his flank to sallies from Uzida, but also because of the broken ground in front of Scipio's army, which would likely disorder his legions' cohesion. However, just before sunset, Scipio's cavalry, which was far off on the side, separated from the rest of the army by a huge morass, made a feint towards Caesar's camp which triggered Caesar's own cavalry's countercharge, who then got bogged down in the morass and beaten off with losses. After this success, Scipio entrenched himself there, thus permanently ending Caesar's attempts at out outflankment, and also perhaps threatening Caesar's communication lines approaching Uzita. Meanwhile, as two legions were coming over from Sicily, the enemy's naval commander Varus tried to intercept them. Caesar sent two fleets to either end of his strip of coastline, of which the northern fleet was prevented from arriving by a storm and forced to take harbor, which enabled Varus to slip past and into Caesar's rendezvous area at Leptis, where they burned all of Caesar's transports and captured two of Caesar's war galleys, which were left unmanned. Hearing of this disaster, Caesar immediately rode six miles to Leptis gathered all the ships, including his northern fleet, and chased Varus, who escaped into the Cothan, Caesar himself being prevented from pursuit by an adverse wind. Caesar's army was now so big that it was running low on corn, and so he sent a foraging expedition ten miles, which was successful. Lavienus, hearing of it, set another ambush there along the same routes, and even built a nearby camp, hoping that he would ambush Caesar the next time he tried this. Caesar, hearing about it from deserters, waited a few days until monotony set in, then set out with eight legions and surprised them, driving them into retreat. Thoroughly outmaneuvered, Caesar decamped and headed off to the city of Agar in quest of provisions. Scipio therefore also decamped and followed him, passing by and establishing a triple camp above Tegea. Caesar learned from a deserter that Scipio had sent two legions further into the country to Zeta to forage. Caesar therefore transferred his army to a new, closer, and more defensible hill camp, then slipping out at 3 a.m., passed right by Scipio's three camps, and seized Zeta, capturing its garrison but not the two legions, which were luckily off foraging. Caesar gave chase, but 
Scipio's army then came up to support them, enabling them to escape and reunite, so Caesar headed back home. Nearing to Scipio's camp along the way, Labienus' cavalry emerged out of hiding and attacked Caesar's rear. Caesar detached his own cavalry to receive the charge and drove them off extremely easily, but found that they'd always re-attack the moment he started marching again. After four hours of this, realizing they weren't making any forward progress and that the, the enemy's ulterior motive must be to force him to camp in this thoroughly dry area, he decided to defend instead with his legions and just go anyways, which proved successful. Around this time, the town of Vaca, right next to Zeta, sent ambassadors asking for a garrison. But before Caesar's garrison could arrive, Juba heard of it, sacked it, and massacred the populace. Twice after this, Caesar offered battle to Scipio without inducing his army to come out. Consequently, Caesar headed instead for Sarsura, where Scipio had a garrison and a lot of corn. All of Scipio's light troops and cavalry set out chasing Caesar, harassing him along the whole way, but unable to stop his progress, ultimately having to watch from a mountain as Caesar sacked the city and slaughtered the unsurrendering garrison. Caesar headed next to Tisdra, where Scipio had a strong garrison, including a cohort of gladiators. However, Caesar couldn't take it for need of immediate food, so Caesar headed four miles off and encamped near a river, then ultimately returned to his former camp at Agar, whereat Scipio also returned to his at Tegea. A third time, Caesar offered Scipio battle. Caesar finally made the first move, sending his cavalry to attack Scipio's. Scipio kept feeding in reinforcements, so Caesar sent 300 legionaries as well. As it was now 700 Caesarians against 4,000 Republicans, the Caesarians began to fall back, so Caesar sent the other wing of cav cavalry, who rallied and drove all the Republicans into flight, killing great numbers all the way to the mountain, and then returning. Since he couldn't induce Scipio's army to come out into the open, Caesar headed off against yet another garrison, this time to take Thapsus. What would force the final battle was that, unlike in the case of Sarsura, Caesar would need to besiege Thapsus, which meant that Scipio would have plenty of time to react and have no excuse for not coming to its assistance. As Caesar invested Thapsus, Scipio built a camp eight miles away and planned to supply the city along a strip of beach between the sea and an inland salt morass. Caesar, having foreseen this, had placed a triple fort there at his end. Disappointed in his intent, Scipio therefore decided instead to bring his entire army up close so that he could use his own fortifications to bypass this fort. Caesar was therefore shocked to learn the next day that Scipio's entire army was on the other side of Thapsus building a new camp as fast as possible. Therefore, assigning two legions to maintain the siege lines and ordering half the fleet into position behind Scipio with orders to wait and watch for his signal at which they should suddenly roar so as to force Scipio's men to turn around and look. The rest of Caesar's army rushed on its own into battle order and began demanding of him to attack immediately. Caesar didn't want to, intending to proceed more cautiously, but everyone could see that the Republicans' camp was vulnerably only half-built and that the Republicans themselves were chaotically rushing in and out in obvious disorder. In the end, Caesar's own men forced a trumpeter on the right wing to sound a general charge. At first, his centurions tried to stop the army, but it became impossible, and finally Caesar gave good luck as the watchword and spurred his horse towards the enemy lines, thus initiating a cataclysmic general confrontation of perhaps 50,000 Caesarians versus 80,000 Republicans and Numidians. On the right flank, the initially attacking cohorts won the contest to pelt the elephants into stampeding the opposite direction, in this case downhill, and so the elephants stampeded right on through the Republican army and through the gates of the half-built camp, the Caesarians themselves hot in their heels, leaving the Numidian cavalry separated and unsupported, who then fled also. Seeing that their entire left flank had disappeared, and that Caesar's men had even seized control of part of their camp, so that they were threatening complete envelopment, Scipio's entire army broke and fled, mostly heading for the previous day's camp eight miles away. With Caesar's army hot on their heels, 
Seeing this, the garrison in Thapsus tried to burst out of the Oceanside Gate and cross the morass to join them. But Caesar's own besiegers intercepted them, navel deep in the water, and drove them back with darts and rocks, leaving them no choice but to return to the city. Meanwhile, the Republicans continued heading for yesterday's camp with Caesar's army in pursuit. Upon arriving there, they looked for someone to elect as leader, but finding none, they threw down their weapons and ran to the nearby camp of King Juba, where they found Caesar's men already in possession of the camp. Running up there for the nearest hill, they attempted to militarily salute Caesar's men, who were obviously enraged that they had to try to fight again the same decisive battle that they had fought two years earlier at Pharsalus. And consequently, they became so bloodthirstily crazed with rage that they began slaughtering the surrenderers, and indeed everyone in sight, even senators on their own side, who hadn't been anti-Republican enough, all with complete deafness to Caesar's entreaties to stop the carnage. Thus, all the Republicans at this location were killed, the whole battle having resulted in the deaths of about 10,000. Afterwards, Caesar both displayed the captured elephants, and erected his tribunal for handing out awards in full view of Thapsus, which still refused to surrender. He therefore left the siege in place, and sent two legions to nearby Tisdra to besiege that, and then sent the cavalry off toward the Republican capital of Utica, where Cato was based, obviously expecting it to surrender at this point. The fleeing Republican cavalry ahead of them, also heading toward Utica, upon being denied admission to the waypoint of Parada, broke in and massacred the entire population. King Juba, heading off to his capital of Zama Regia, or Royal Zama, found himself denied entrance to his own capital, which wouldn't even deliver out to him all his wives and possessions, for he had ordered that a great pile of wood be erected in the forum, intending to burn everyone upon it. He therefore left and committed suicide at one of his country estates, by perversely fighting with a fellow Republican general, so that at least one of them might meet a supposedly honorable death. Cato also committed suicide, after realizing that the inhabitants of Utica didn't want to continue resistance, and he was honorably buried by them for his otherwise highly respectable conduct. Meanwhile, Caesar himself marched to Usceta. Note, is this the same as Usita? Then to Adramedum, receiving both of their surrenders. Caesar then sailed for Utica, which had already surrendered to his cavalry, and where Caesar fined but forgave the merchants who had financed the war. All in all, then, the Thapsus campaign leaves behind a map strewn with battles, earthworks, and place names, complete with intervening distances, basically an archaeologist and cartographer's paradise. Please see the other video for further discussion of how all this combines with the ancient Roman Pudinger and Ptolemaic maps to confirm the scholars' major error of placing this battle and its entire Tunisian heartland 75 miles to the south of where it actually is, which is right here. Thanks for watching. You can download all the Google Earth KMZ files of cities that you saw in the background here, complete with all the academic analysis of each pinned site from my website particularly from the Rep Africa repository. And similarly, this battle's KMZ file can be downloaded from the link in the video description. Lastly, if you think that my methods have potential for great discoveries, know that I'm running out of time financially. I won't be able to continue this kind of work for much longer unless I either get a grant or, better, get into a research institution. For I only have two and a half, really three, bachelors, but no advanced de degrees. If you'd then be so willing to write me a recommendation, especially if you're in academia, then please email me at the email address in the video. Institutions today positively are looking for people with publishing ability, which is a rare skill that I have and would be willing to work on a team to bring about, but I have no connections because I have been an independent scholar and researcher up to this point. Additionally, if you're a homeschooler, I offer my 400-page philosophy textbook for free at the link in the video description, or you can go to writelatin.org to self-study at Latin, but um, that's just using the self-study textbook, Lingua Latina per se illustrata, whereas, and my website makes it active so that you actually have scaffolded um, writing of Latin and it tells you whether you did it right or wrong, so you um, develop reliability in that way. Additionally, if you'd like to give me a short gift, go to the teacherspayteachers.com and find my high tech Latin storefront and just buy anything. Thank you for your consideration and have a good day. Bye bye.